Chapter 29 The Culture of Holiness Numbers 16, 36 to 40 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire thunder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord. Therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers, wherewith they that were burnt had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. Numbers 16, 36 to 40. This is an unusual and very important text, and also a very comforting one when understood. It is very plainly declared to be for a warning to all future generations coming to the sanctuary. All the censors used by Korah and his 250 associates, leaders or princes of the tribe or clans, were to be melted down. These were made of bronze and were to be used to make a covering for the altar of burnt offering. A man was assigned to this task, Eleazar, verse 37, one of Aaron's sons. Eleazar later succeeded Aaron as high priest, Numbers 20, 22 to 29. Although God had rejected Korah and his associates and had sentenced them to a swift death, Incineration, the censers, having been offered to God, were holy, even though the men who offered the incense were presumptuous, evil, and sentenced to death. God will have his due of all men, even when he rejects their persons. How and when he does this is his sovereign prerogative, but he will have his due. For this reason, Eleazar is commanded to collect the bronze censers. He had no option but to obey God or suffer his judgment. God's claim on what was offered to him, even by evil men, was irreversible. This is not all. In verse 37, Eleazar is ordered to Scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The fire in all the censers had to be scattered in order for the fire to go out. In antiquity, and until recently, a fire was not allowed to go out casually. Before matches were invented, starting a fire was a slow process, and therefore an old fire was not usually put out. It was used to light a new one. However, even though the intentions of the men were evil and presumptuous, the fire had been dedicated to God, so, together with the censers, it could have no other use. Whatever is dedicated or given to God cannot be used in other ways. It is a part of the heresy of democracy to make what belongs to God common property. This was done by Red China in turning all churches into community buildings, and it is done by churches which treat God's sanctuary as a multi-purpose room. Whatever is given to God is for all time his property. We have a trace of this fact, once a Christian premise, in the laws respecting all non-profit groups, Christian or secular. On dissolution, their property and assets must, by law, go to a similar non-profit group. One of the great neglected classics is Sir Henry Spellman's The History and Fate of Sacrilege. First written in 1632, it was last published in 1888. Spellman traced the history of all those families who took the church lands expropriated by Henry VIII 
who assured his success by making large numbers of men, his fellow profiteers from the Caesar of church foundations, buildings and lands. As compared with the noble families who refused to participate in this sacrilege, the participating families were clearly cursed in a variety of ways, including a failure of heirs. By 1632, of the 470 families out of 570 peers implicated in the sacrilege, 66 or 67 had no heirs, and more failed subsequently. Disaster struck these sacrilegious families to a far higher degree than it did others, and all this in a relatively short span of time. Sacrilege is no light matter. The fact that our age is blind to it no more alters the grim reality of this kind of judgment than blindness of one's eyes eliminates the sun from the heavens. The premise of God's law is The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24.1 We are stewards in his house and we are given permission to use and do certain things and must abstain from doing others. Sacrilege despises God's property rights and creates its own rules. It is lawlessness, as Paul says. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Romans 2, 21-23 All lawless men and churches are guilty of sacrilege, but sacrilege is especially serious wherever what is set apart for God's use is put to other purposes. The bronze cover for the altar, made from the censers, was a continual reminder to those who would see with seeing eyes God's penalty on sacrilege. It was also a reminder to the priests, if they would pay attention. In Bishop Hall's words, It is a dangerous thing to usurp sacred functions. The ministry will not grace the man. The man may disgrace the ministry. It is thus a serious error to see the mere fact of ordination as conferring grace. Much of the church's troubles stem from this error. With respect to the censers being made into bronze cover for the altar, Marsing observed, The pole of sin had to be transformed at the Lord's command into the positive feature of a warning sign. In Psalm 76.10 we are told, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. According to Kirkpatrick this means, All rebellion against God's will must in the end redound to God's glory. It serves to set his sovereignty in a clearer light. Exodus 9.16 it shall all turn to God's praise. What this means is that all things work together to accomplish God's purpose, including all the evil men do. The amazing fact that St. Paul emphasizes is that this is also true for God's elect people. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Whether or not this is partially, fully, or not at all true in time, it is true for all eternity. According to Exodus 29.37, Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. The same statement is made in Exodus 30.29 and in Leviticus 6.18 and 27. Anything withdrawn from the sphere of the profane from outside God's sanctuary becomes thereby holy. This means, for example, that baptism separates us from the profane world 
to make us members of God's holy congregation, and any profanation of ourselves then becomes sacrilege. The implications of this are very important. In the modern perspective, the concept of holiness has been replaced by the doctrine of rights. And rights mean in practice interests, personal concerns. Man's will is exalted to the position of a final moral standard, and a culture of rights leads, as John H. Hallowell pointed out, in The Decline of Liberalism as an Ideology, to complete subjectivism and immorality. A culture of holiness looks beyond autonomy or self-law to theonomy or God's law. In a culture of holiness, men look to God for direction. In a culture of rights, they look to men. In Haggai 2, 10-14, we are told, In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt to touch bread or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. These words are especially relevant to our text and to our time. What man of himself communicates to things in men is sin. He has no inherent justice, morality, or merits that he or any institution can ever transmit to anyone. Holiness is not communicated by men, but by God, and it is therefore to God that we must look for the basis of our culture. Rights create, at best and at their highest, an eccentric or off-centre culture whose direction is downward. The culture of holiness looks to God's grace and law, to His justice and mercy. Jude 11 has a reference to this episode and calls it the gainsaying of Kore or Korah. The word gainsaying is antilogia in the Greek, anti meaning against and logia from a root meaning expression or word. It therefore means rebellion or disobedience. Now, this hostile word of Korah had been, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. Numbers 16.3 Even had this been true, in Israel or in the church, it could not be used to undermine authority, nor to insist on an equality of all men one with another, or before God. In the culture of holiness, as against the culture of rights, the goal of society is not democracy or equality, it is justice. God's justice, and God's order, not man's disorder. Again, we see the very great importance of numbers. A slave people demanded equality. They insisted on their equal rights before God. They rebelled against the authority of Moses, a God-ordained authority, and they died in the wilderness 